The Challenge of the Yukon. It's King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the North Country, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On you, husband! Gold. Gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the greedy race for riches. Now back to the days of the gold rush when Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, King, battled through storm and snow to preserve law and order as they met the challenge of the Yukon. Jim Ellis, an old prospector, lived about four miles outside of Star City in a small cabin. It was early morning, and Jim was having his breakfast. A small mongrel dog sat beside his chair, looking at him expectantly. Well, I already gave you your breakfast, Snapper. <laughs> I guess it's just the idea that you want to share mine. Is that it? <laughs> All right. Here. Here's a piece of bread. Well, I guess I ought to set up another chair at the table every morning and have breakfast with you. <laughs> Well, you're sure good company, old girl. Hmm, it's a dog team. Quiet, Snapper. Hey, that sounds like Sergeant Preston. Ah, hello, Sergeant. Now, ah, quiet, Snapper. Are you sure, are, Sergeant? Come on in. All right to bring King in? Sure, bring him in. Snapper won't fight with him. Always glad to see King. I'm just getting back from the patrol north, Jim. Couldn't quite make town last night. Well, take off your park and sit down. He's already. Thanks. I'm glad you stopped by. I was making a collar for Snapper, and I thought while I was at it, I'd make one for King, too. I got it over there in the cupboard. Well, that was nice of you, Jim. Oh, uh, how are you getting along with your claim? Just fine. Been taking quite a bit of gold out of it lately. Oh. Huh? You ought to come into town with me today and bring that gold along. You're all alone out here. It's not safe having so much of it around. Well, Mike Burry lives near me. We've been good friends for a long time. Mike drops in here a lot. Well, don't you worry. I'll bring the gold in later this week. Now, now, you sit down and have some breakfast. Later in the day, Sergeant Preston was in the back room of Dave McLaren's trading post to make out his reports and attend to other paperwork when he was in Star City. I don't want to disturb you, Sergeant Preston. Oh, uh, come on in, Dave. I'm just about finished. Oh, I wondered if you needed more writing paper or pencils or anything. Why, no, Dave. What I need is a loose end. Huh? A loose end? Yeah. You ever been haunted by something you should have done and you can't remember what it is? Is it something you've got to do in Star City? No, it doesn't seem to be. Well, maybe it's something to do with King. Isn't he with you? He's outside in front of the post waiting for me. I wish I could think of what it is. Well, you came from up north, Sergeant. Maybe you left something uh, unfinished in the line of business up there. Say, well, that's it. Oh, confound it, Dave. I've got to go back to Jim Ellis' place. Why? What's the matter at Ellis's? Oh, nothing's the matter. When we left this morning, I forgot to take a dog collar Jim made for King. I don't want to hurt his feelings, so we'll go back for it. Well, as long as you're going that way, Sergeant. Maybe you won't mind dropping these letters off for Jim. Be glad to, Dave. Mike Burry's taking some equipment out to him, and uh, I could give these letters to him. Oh, why don't you? I wouldn't trust him with mail. He might read it or something. These letters are from Jim's niece. Well, I'll drop them off, but I've never heard anything against Burry. Dogs don't like him. Oh, that's so? Sergeant, see if you can talk Jim into going back to California. He's got enough gold to take care of himself and his niece for the rest of their lives. Yes, he made a good strike, all right. He shouldn't keep so much gold in that cabin up there by himself with Burry as near the nearest neighbor. It's just bait for a lot of trouble. Downright dangerous. Men have been killed, alas. Yes, you're right, Dave. Uh, I guess Burr's back to get his sled. I heard his team out there. Yeah, listen to him. He beats the living daylights out of him. Oh? Did you say King's out there, Sergeant? Yes. I hope Burry don't tangle with him. For Burry's sake, he'd better not. King won't bother him if he lets him alone, but 
Mike will have more than he can handle if he crosses my dog. Well, I'd like to see that, Sergeant. Yes, sir, I sure would. I never yet seen a dog that didn't hate Mike Burns. Shut up, you here for no good house. Shut up, I'm telling you. Hey, Mike Burry. Pete. Jackson. <laughs> Mike. I blame near took you for a Mountie in that red party. <laughs> Yeah, the boys at the cafe said you were in town. Yeah, I'm staying at Sullivan's Hotel. Hey, why not come out to my place? It won't cost as much. Well, thanks. I think I'll do that. Now, wait while you collect your gear. Everything I own is on my back. How far do we go? Well, my cab's about four hours from here. Yeah, listen to them miserable hours. Shut up! What are they barking at, Mike? Yeah, that husky over there's got them stirred up, I guess. If he'd move, they'd likely quiet down. He's a good-looking dog. Yeah. He belongs to Preston, the Mountie. And he must be king. Oh, I don't know what his name is, but I'm going to move him. I'll have a hard time lining up my team if he don't get out of here. Look at him, Mike. Not tied up or anything. Any other dog would be running wild if you'd leave him like that. Uh, so you're Preston, the dog, huh? As Pete Jackson admired the big dog... Mike Burry stretched his hand toward the mighty husky. I grab his collar. Go on, you move. King's head was high. He growled once warningly, and Mike's hand stopped, poised over the dog's neck. Look at that coat he's got, Mike. Shiny as a brand new gold piece. That's what comes of feeding a dog good. Come on, fella. Come on. I want to be friends. The great dog sitting in front of the trading post glanced at Pete Jackson, then returned his level gaze to Mike Burry. King tolerated Jackson's hand stroking his thick, furry coat, but his attention was turned toward Mike, Big Mike, whose narrow eyes flashed with sudden fire. Come on, you move! The scent of the angry man filled King's nostrils. The magnificent husky had seen this man lash his own dogs mercilessly with a whip he now held in his hand. King saw that whip hand move. Uh, Maybe you're no different from these other mutts. Maybe the whip's the only thing you understand, too. Well, all right, Mike! Don't bring that whip down. One good crack with this, and he'll blame soon move. Don't, Mike. I've heard about this dog. He's so fast, he'll take your arm off before the whip comes down. I'm not kidding you. He's dynamite. Don't get him riled, Mike. Leave him alone. A dog don't live that I'm afraid of. King saw Mike Burry raise the whip. He stood up, the fur on the back of his neck bristling, his eyes flashing, his saber-like fangs gleaming dangerously. The great husky was poised, ready to spring. And the man saw the lean, fierce strength about to be unleashed. Man and dog measured each other. Better leave him alone, Mike. Well, now, come on, Pete. I don't aim to get him riled. You're smart, Mike. That dog's nothing to fool with. <laughs> All right, you miserable pack of wolf. Me line up there. Line up! Get in a sledge, Pete. All right. Good-looking equipment you have in here, Mike. That's not mine. I'm taking it out to Jim Ellis's. Mike, you are a thief! Mike! What a monster! Can you make your place before dark? No, we can if we don't stop at Ellis's. We'll go to my place first, get the fire built up, and have something to eat. We can go around to Jim's later. Hey, monster! get enough of my pelts to go back to the stage. You can go back right now. I'll take plenty of gold with you if I've heard right. Are you loco how? Ellis. He keeps his gold in his cabin, don't he? Yeah, but... Mike, I'm going to get that gold. Oh? Uh-huh. Are you with me? Well, I... I, I don't know. Or would you rather walk a trap line for the rest of your life? Hoping from year to year that the next one will be better. No, 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 nothing like that. Eh? So, uh, I'm with you, Pete. Then let's go. If we take the stuff with us, he won't be suspicious. All right. If we leave now, we can get there before the snow starts. 
There's a storm coming. Here's your stuff, Chip. Close the door, Pete. Yeah. This here's my friend, Pete Jackson. Pete, Jim Ellis. Howdy, yeah, Pete. Jim. Doesn't know you. Here, put that stuff on the floor, boy. Yeah, yeah. sure. I'm uh, much obliged to you for bringing it up, Mike. Get out. Get down to your head. Snapper, snapper. Leave Mike alone. Get down now. <laughs> Sit down. I'll get some coffee going. Little two bit here barks at you the same way your team does, Mike. Yeah, dogs don't like me much. <laughs> well, you know what they say, Mike. Dogs and babies are supposed to be pretty good judges of men. Generally, they can tell by instinct whether a man's good or bad. Yeah, and yeah, that's a loco saying. Dogs are dumber than pack mules. Oh, no, Mike. Dogs are smart. Mm, smart or dumb, this one don't like me. <laughs> well, maybe she knows you better than you do yourself, Mike. Sure you don't have something on your conscience you're not telling us? <laughs> Mike don't like dogs, and they don't like him. Oh, sure. No offense, man. Well, take off your parka skin. We're not staying long. Well, now, maybe you want to get back before the storm breaks. Well, I don't blame you. Mike, your friend has a gun. <laughs> take it easy, Ellis. Mike. No sense wasting time, Jim. Mike, what? What's come over you? You're not going to let him. That's it, Jim. But you can't. No. No, my friend. There. He's dead? Sure, he's dead. Get back. Get away from me. He's jumping at you, Mike. Get down. Get down, you muck. Let go. He's tearing at your pocket. Let go. That got her. Yeah, I should have used a gun on her. Where'd she go? Uh, Scoot her to the woodshed. I guess you taught her a lesson. Hey, good enough. Now pull that chest from under the bunk. That's where he keeps his gold. We'll load it on the sled and get out of here. Hey, Pete, the snow's starting. Good. It'll cover our tracks in no time. And there'll be no way of telling who did this killing. Nobody will ever figure it out. It was two hours after Mike Burry and Pete Jackson left Jim Ellis' cabin. Heavy snow spun dizzily, driven fiercely to earth by a high, cold wind that was like the breath of the Arctic itself. Suddenly, the bark of a dog pierced the howling wind. A magnificent husky who kept steadily to a trail hidden from the eyes of the man following him on snowshoes. Alone with his master in a world of snow, the dog obediently responded to the cry of... It was Sergeant Preston and the great dog King breaking a trail to Jim Ellis' cabin. Long before the Mountie realized that death had struck in the cabin among the foothills, the great dog caught its scent. Stirred by an urgency unknown to the man following him, King lengthened his stride. His ears flattened against his head as he ran. His head was high. His strong, lean body shot ahead like an arrow from a bow, his feet scarcely touching the snow. All right, go on, King. Go on, fella. King reached Jim Ellis' cabin ahead of Sergeant Preston. He looked back anxiously toward his master. All right, King, I'm coming. Well, here we are, boy. Looks like we're in for a lot of snow. You're mighty anxious to get that new collar of yours, fella. That's strange. No sound of anybody moving around in there. Jim usually comes to the door right away. Well, the door's unlocked, King. Before the mount, he could swing it open. The great dog nudged the door ajar with his nose, then stood at the threshold, whimpering as he looked inside. Jim, what? He's been shot, fella. He's dead. No weapon of any kind near him. Looks like cold-blooded murder. And I'll move him to the bunk. There. See, Mike Burry was here. There are the supplies and equipment he left. King crossed to the small dog cowering in the corner. Well, King, what's happened to Snapper? King drew back as his master stroked the badly frightened dog. He watched, knowing that Snapper needed the reassurance of the Mountie. Then King saw the sergeant take a piece of cloth 
from beneath Snapper. It was the same color as the tunic of his master. The same color, King, a brilliant red. But not the same material as my tunic. It's heavy, looks as if it were torn from a parka. It's the only clue we've got, King. We're going after a killer wearing a red parka. Come on, boy. We'll go and talk to Mike Burry. talk to you. Sergeant Preston, come on in. Quiet, Pete. I say, Pete, here's Sergeant Preston. A sergeant, this is a friend of mine, Pete Jackson. Hello, Pete. Howdy, Sergeant. Quiet, King. <laughs> Don't bother about him growling like that, Sergeant. Dogs always hate me. Well, King usually has better manners. I'm used to the critters acting that way. I say, it's cold out, Sergeant. Maybe you'd like something Why, hot. uh, thanks, Mike. That's a good suggestion. I'll fix some tea. I know you don't drink anything stronger, Sergeant. The tea's right back at the door in the kitchen, Pete. Yeah, I'll find it. Ah, it While there. Sergeant Preston and Mike Burry talked about inconsequential generalities, the great dog King stood close to his master. King's reaction to Mike Burry was more than mere dislike. For the piece of cloth and the scent of the big trapper were linked in the dog's mind. King knew he was in the presence of the murderer. With mute, tortured eyes, he looked at his master, trying desperately to convey his knowledge. But Sergeant Preston didn't understand. King realized that he alone knew Mike Burry's guilt. Mike, just now I'm looking for a murderer. A murder? Oh, I... Can I uh, do anything to help you, Sergeant? Was Jim Ellis all right when you left the equipment at his cabin? Oh, sure, sure, he was fine. Why? He's been murdered, Mike. Jim murder. It's his murderer I'm looking for. Well, I'll be... <laughs> I can hardly believe it. Uh, do you have any suspicions of who might have done it? Only this. This piece that was torn from the killer's parka. Uh, it ought to be easy to find a parka of that color. That's what I'm counting on. People will remember a red parka. Yeah, uh, yeah, they should. <laughs> Pete's a long time fixing that tea. I'd better go see what's holding him up. Now, just be a second, Sergeant. That's all right, Mike. Quiet, right. right. King. What's the matter, Mike? I'll get the cuffs out. Hey, you found the tea all right, Pete? Preston's got a piece of my parka. What? No, you need more tea than that, Pete. Make it strong. Ellis's dog tore it off the corner. And he don't know it's your parka? No. Now, listen, Pete. Put this stuff in the tea. That... What is it? Knockout drops. Pour all of it in. Take hold of him about ten minutes after he drinks it. Murder in a mouth is suicide, Mike. Who said anything about murder? When this hits him, he'll pass out in the snow between here and Ellis's place. The cold will get him and he'll freeze to death. That's a slick idea. It'll look like an accident. Yeah, when the water boils, just pour all the tea, Pete. I'll be ready any minute now. Now, you go on in and sit down. I'll watch it for you. All right. It'll be ready in just a minute, Sergeant. If there's any trouble, Pete, I... Oh, no trouble at all. <laughs> just that uh, I don't know where Mike keeps things. Sergeant, uh, Mike was telling me about poor Jim. Why do you figure Jim was killed? For his gold. He was murdered and robbed. On a night like this, you wouldn't think anybody would be out. From the murderer's point of view, the night's perfect, Pete. Snow's already covered all tracks. Uh, here you are, Sergeant. Steaming hot. That's fine. King! Hey, 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 Down, King! Down, boy! Hey, well, you upset it. I blame near burned my hand off. Well, Sergeant, looks like your tea's on the floor. I swear that dog jumped for me. I'm sorry, Mike. Is your hand all right? I miss getting burned. Hey, King, come here. You want me to put water on for more tea, Mike? Oh, yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Well, uh, no thanks just the same, Mike. I've got to shove on. Oh, it's no trouble, Sergeant. It won't take but a minute. We'll have it ready in two shakes. You need something hot to warm you up after being out in this weather. We've thawed out nicely just being inside for a few minutes. Has to be getting along now. I'm going back to Star City to ask some questions about a red parka. A red parka? Yes, this piece torn from a red parka is the only clue to the killer. Hey, maybe I could help you, Sergeant. Huh? What do you mean? Well, uh, I came from up north just a few days ago, you know. Yes? There's a fellow up north of here, just this side of Twin Rock... It has a parka, just that color. That's all? He lives in the cabin back off the trail. Just a one-room shack. Oh, yes, I know the one you mean. 
I'll go up there right now. If you don't find him, come back here and we'll go into town with you. I'll do that. Come on, King. All right. Outside, boy. Outside, King. Oh, uh, sorry about that sea. Oh, forget it. Nobody was hurt. You won't be able to cover much ground in this storm. It'll slow the killer down, too. Thanks for your help. Good luck, Sergeant. Now, if you don't find him, come back here. I will. Goodbye. Go on. Untangle <laughs> Idea. I had to think of something after that dog upset the pot of tea. Yeah, that blame mutt. I'd like to take just one shot at that husky. Just one. Listen, Mike. I got Preston off our necks for the time being. But you've got to think of something. Hey, is there anybody up north with the red parking? No. You won't find anything up there but an abandoned cabin. That means he'll come back here. Yeah. So we can clear out now and then... That'll be fine. Preston comes back and finds us gone. He puts two and two together and starts after us. And that Mountie gets what he goes after. Then we've got to stop him. The only way to stop him is with a bullet. If we do that, the whole mounted police force would be after us before we can get out of the territory. It's got to look like an accident, Pete. We have to figure the dog in on it, too. He's smart. Too smart. It's a good thing to park in the gold in the kitchen. Pete, I got it. What? Get your parka and snowshoes. Where are we going? Out along the north trail. Trail? What for? Now follow me. I'll explain it to you while we're traveling. Now, come on. And bring a shovel with you. How far are we going, Mike? Just a little ways. How long will it take Preston to get to that cabin? About three hours. That means we got about five. Five hours of what? This storm's getting worse, Mike. Relax. I got a smart idea, Pete. That better be smart. Uh, what are you stopping for? Tell us as far as we go. There's not a blame thing here, but a narrow trail with a lot of timber on each side of it. What are you trying Preston, to... Preston, Preston's coming back here, right? You're doggone right here. Uh, help me straight away to snow. Are you digging for something? Do as I tell you. All right, <laughs> see anything here but a couple of logs under the snow. That's right. These logs cover up a trap. Oh, you mean a pitfall? Yeah. I dug it myself this spring and baited it to catch a grizzly that was too smart for a steel trap. Who <coughs> covered it? I did just before the stove set in. It was dangerous. We're going to let them logs off it. Oh, I get it. So when Preston comes... In this weather, you freeze before he starts. Yeah. Look like an accident. If that dog gets smart, we'll shoot him. People will think the Mountie shot him to put him out of his misery. We can watch for him from behind that timber. Yeah. <laughs> the dog warns him, we'll drop the dog. Knock Preston out and throw him in. Can you see him coming, Pete? Can't see anything through the snow. You ought to be here soon. It's a good thing the snow's coming down heavy. It's already covered them fresh boughs we put over the pit for. Yeah. Listen. You hear them? Hard to tell with the wind. I think I hear the dog. Yeah. They're coming. Keep your eyes on that dog. Yeah, don't worry. One smart move out of him and I'll drop him in his tracks. But don't shoot too fast, Mike. Preston, don't get wise. It'll be all the better for us. It'll be perfect if he walks into that trap under his own steam. Right. But for my money, I hope that dog tries something. Don't shoot unless we're sure he knows what's up. That's him, all right. They're getting closer, Pete. They're getting closer. That's it, King. On, fella. On. Too bad we made this trip for nothing, boy. We'll learn something in Star City. The great dog, King, was just a few paces ahead of his master, breaking a trail through the unmarked blanket of snow. The soft white flakes were falling heavily, glittering in the moonlight that would soon fade into dawn. King knew from the sounds and scents of the wilderness that he and the Mountie were the only living things stirring. When we get to Star City, King, I'll write a letter to Jim's niece, poor girl. Let's travel a bit faster, King. King obediently quickened his pace. As the dog moved ahead, a new scent filled his nostrils. Freshly cut pine, 
Us Santee hadn't noticed when they covered the trail a few hours earlier. It's slowing down, fella. Go on, we got a lot of work ahead of us. King had shortened his stride. His animal caution warned him to go slowly, to be alert. And then he stopped abruptly. The scent of pine was heavy in the air. King, you're blocking the trail. Go on, boy. There's no time to be digging in the snow. You're throwing up a lot of snow, fella. Must be something important. I wonder. Here, boy. I'll help you. Yeah, smells like pine. Yeah, nearly cut boughs. They weren't here before. They couldn't have been. We'll dig deeper, King. <laughs> Seems to be a... What? Pine boughs stretched out to cover a pitfall. As the mountain straightened, King turned and looked about him. I don't know why, but I feel as if somebody's watching him. The dog's fur stood up sharply on the back of his neck. A foreign scent filled his nostrils, and immediately he recognized the presence of Mike Burry and Pete Jackson. His master stood behind him on the trail. The Mountie sensed danger, but he didn't know from where it would come. Neither the dog nor the man knew that at that very moment, a rifle was being raised, and they were the target. King looked toward a growth of brush. We'd make perfect targets, King. It was then they heard it. Mike Burry pulled back the rifle's hammer. Instantly, Sergeant Preston recognized the sound. He threw himself to the ground, and a moment later, a brief tongue of flame told him where the gunman was hiding. But the bullet was over the Mountie's head. The great dog King was already in motion, running close to the ground. Before either Mike Burry or Pete Jackson could fire again, the dog leaped. In one blinding flash, the dog spanned the distance that separated him from the killer. King struck Mike Burry with a force that knocked the man to the ground. Pinning Mike Burry to the ground, King turned for a moment toward Pete Jackson. I'm coming, boy. You're covered, both of you. Get away from me. Get away. Don't make a move, Pete. You've got to call off that dog. He'll kill me. Try anything and he'll turn on you. All right, King. Quiet, boy. Get up, Burry. I see my search for the Red Parker has ended. Why didn't you drop the much, you fool? You had your gun. You could have shot the dog. I couldn't. That's how I move. He'd have got me. Why, you yellow striped polecat. If you think I'm taking the blame for the murder you did, you're crazy. He killed Ellis, Sergeant. Oh, go ahead, You're talking a noose right around her neck. Now, shut up. He's already said enough. The Red Parker, the trap you set, the ambush, it all fits together. You'll both hang for murder. Where's Jim's gold? In my cabin under the kitchen. We'll go back and pick it up. And then we're going to the jail in Star City. If either one of you makes a break... Oh, we won't make no trouble. Get moving. Just, just keep that dog away from us. I'd almost rather hang than have him tear me apart. Remember that, and you'll live to hang. <laughs> yes, King. Thanks to you, the case is closed. <laughs> Challenge of the Yukon is a copyrighted feature, and all characters, names, and incidents used are fictitious. The Challenge of the Yukon will be heard next week on Thursday at the same time over most of these stations. Consult your local newspaper to be sure. El Prow speaking. This program came to you from Detroit. Nothing to do. No place to go. Family was away from home most of the time. That's the kind of explanation you often hear when children are taken into courts on juvenile delinquency charges. Realizing this nationwide problem, David Harding, counter-spy, recently devoted two separate programs to some of the causes and solutions of juvenile crime. Although the stories were fictional, they closely paralleled some real-life case histories. In both programs, David Harding brought out that it's usually not the children themselves who are at fault, rather it's their companions, or their parents who've neglected them. In addition to tackling juvenile delinquency, David Harding, counter-spy, has been quick to dramatize any serious contemporary problem. For 30 minutes of lively action paralleling the headlines, listen to David Harding, counter-spy.